Hi. Um, here we go. It's our first uh, chapter for this summer class of human growth and development. I'm Dr. Johnston, as hopefully you know by now. Um, our first chapter is really just an introduction um, to developmental psychology and hopefully some review of some things you already know. Uh, so just to make clear, right, if psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes, um, then developmental psychology is going to be looking at those behaviors and mental processes over time. Um, it's a scientific um, research area. Um, we're going to be looking at evidence from research studies throughout the semester, um, and those are going to be over the lifespan from conception, um, mean when that sperm and egg come together, um, all the way to the end of life in our 80s, 90s, and above. So it's huge, right? It's a massive area. It's like thinking back to introduction to psychology and looking at each one of those topics, but now at every different age. So it's just a massive field. I just wanna also kind of set the stage for the research we're gonna be looking at throughout the semester. There are really four goals in psychology and in most sciences. Um, and those goals are really going to um, be apparent when we're looking at the type of research evidence we're talking about. So our first goal, when we're looking at any subject, any question that you have as a scientist, um, is what is this behavior? Can we describe it? Let's observe it. Let's come up with names and terms for the concepts we're looking at. Once we can describe something, then maybe we can start to try to explain what's going on, right? Can we understand why these things are happening? And if we can, if we can come up with those explanations through our scientific method, then we can start to predict what's going to happen, right? If this happens, then we know the underlying cause, so we can say this why X happens, Y is likely to happen. And if we can pre make predictions, then we can start to change or modify behavior. Um, and that's going to help us um, change um, undesirable behaviors. So these are all different parts of the scientific process. So when we're talking about a certain research study, we might just be describing things that might be where we're at in the science. Or it might be something that's been studied for so long that we already understand it. We can make predictions and we're actually now working in the field to try to make changes with people. So knowing where you're at in the process is gonna be helpful for understanding why sometimes we might be limited in understanding what's going on with a person. We might just be at the describing stage or we might be at the modifying stage. Okay. When we look at the course that we're taking right now, uh, it's divided up into three domains, the physical domain, cognitive domain, and psychosocial domain. So physical development is focusing on your body, right? You are born, you're tiny, you weigh seven pounds, you start to grow, your body changes, your muscles grow, uh, you hit puberty, you learn how to play, do a cartwheel, um, you get older, you yourself can now have babies and you go through menopause, you start to lo lose uh, muscle mass, bone tissue, all of these things are in physical development. And this is really the area of medicine, right? Your pediatrician, your general doctor, they're studying physical changes. Our second domain is the cognitive domain. And this is your thoughts, right? How do you learn? How does your memory work? How do you learn languages? Um, this is actually my specialty, cognitive psychology. So thinking, intelligence, learning, memory, language. Um, we're gonna talk about those in the middle section of the course. And it's going to be about how those things change over the lifespan. Our third domain, which is the second half um, of this course, the end of this course, is the psychosocial development. This includes your development of your personality, your emotional development, um, and then all of your social relationships, your family structure, um, school, work, friends, all of those things. So we can think about these three different domains and really we have different experts in these three different areas, right? With physical, you've got more medical doctors, cognitive, you've got psychologists, 
In psychosocial development, you often have sociologists, social workers, therapists, counselors, um, all of those. So I would like you to kind of imagine, right, how these are not three separate domains, even though that's how we're going to be addressing it in this class. These things really interact, right? They affect each other, right? One of the topics we're going to talk about or learn about is um, puberty, right? So that's a biological process. But certainly you can imagine that if, let's say, as a boy, you hit puberty early, that might affect the way you feel about yourself, your emotions, and your relationships with other people. Often it's found in boys to be a good thing, right? You grow your muscles, you're taller, you're more athletic, stronger, earlier than your peers. Um, this is often seen positively. It may lead to higher self-esteem and better relationships. And the way you think about yourself, right? You're learning in school. Uh, it can be affected by all of these other things, right? The way you feel about yourself, your self-esteem can impact your interest in school, how other people, your teachers treat you, um, your level of learning and how you're perceived. Okay, so all these things can affect each other. And you can imagine even maybe for yourself, looking back on your life, how those things impacted each other. Okay, I also want to kind of very, very quickly go over the fact that we've divided up the lifespan into different age ranges and put labels with them. This is um, just a social construct, meaning it's kind of just divided up and labeled in a way that seems to make sense. Um, these labels have changed over the years. Um, and your book um, here has um, its list. It's roughly the same. You're never going to be grilled on if someone's two and a half versus three, what period are they in? You know, these are just general and you need to know the order. Um, prenatal period is from conception to birth. Um, we'll be talking about that next week. Infancy is birth to about a year and a half and toddlerhood. Um, that's your twos and threes. Early childhood, preschool age, age three to six. Middle childhood, age six to 11. So that's all of your elementary school. Adolescence, right now, we're saying is 11 to 20. Um, I Many, many, many years ago, I thought of it as age 13 to 18. Um, but, and back in, let's say, 1920, the concept of adolescence did not even exist. You went from being a child to being an adult. But now in the United States, we definitely um, identify a lengthy adolescent period. Young adulthood, age 20 to 40 middle adulthood, 40 to 65, and late, late adulthood over age 65. So these are just general um, groupings that will help us throughout the semester to talk about what's going on um, in each of these ages. Okay. So let's get to um, some major themes that we'll see throughout the semester. Um, influences on development. So the first one, hopefully you've heard of before, nature versus nurture. Right, so nature, let's get this straight because these words are way too similar, right? Nature is what you're born with, right? It's your DNA, really. It's the biological uh, foundations that you are given by your biological parents. So that's your DNA. Nurture is everything else, right? It's not just the parenting that you receive or the nutrition you get or your school you get to go to. It's also... Um, your prenatal development, right? The access your mother had to good prenatal care, prenatal vitamins, good nutrition, avoiding um, toxic chemicals and things like that. Um, that would also be considered nurture. Then you're born, you learn language, you have all kinds of experiences in your life and that is all nurture. And researchers in developmental psychology um, are typically in one of the two camps because you're either doing research with DNA and um, hereditary components or you're looking more at influences from the environment. It's just different ways to do research. Um, the overwhelming majority of what we'll talk about in this class is in the nurture category. When we look, we can see um, some very specific influences that pull apart this nature versus nurture. So normative influences. Normative influences are things that normally happen, things that we expect to happen. And we can put these into three general categories. 
Our first is what's called history graded influences, or history graded normative influences or cohort influences. These are common experiences you've had based on when and where you were born. So you can think of it as like the generation effect. We've got very specific experiences that in the United States, baby boomers have experienced, Gen X people like me have experienced, um, millennials have experienced, and now even not quite sure what the newest generation is called, right? Um, I like to share that when I was a kid, one of my biggest fears was nuclear war. I think most millennials are not really thinking about that at all, but that was huge. Growing up with Reagan as our president, the Cold War with Russia, nuclear bombs, right? That's just not something that other generations really have been that focused on. So that's what a history graded influence is. It's about the generation you belong to and that kind of experiences that you've had that affect the way we those individuals think about the world and themselves. Um, age graded influences are um, things that you would expect to happen based on your age. So think about um, hitting puberty between 11 and 14, uh, getting your driver's license in the United States around 15, 16, um, graduating from high school. These are things that are expected um, and that most people are experiencing. Uh, Socio-cultural graded influences are um, expectations that are more specific to your culture. Uh, for instance, I'm Catholic, so I expect um, my uh, cultural in, within my cultural group that in second grade we're going to have a first communion, we're going to have a party. Um, in ninth grade, we're going to have confirmation parties. So all these rituals that are expected based on your age um, that go with my cultural group. Okay, there's, it's also important to note that while most people are experiencing these normative influences, there are also some very impactful non-normative life events. So these are things that are unique to you um, that don't fit with what everybody else is experiencing. So a non-normative um, life event could be um, the, like, a friend of ours, um, their son, when he was 10, developed leukemia. That was not normal, right? Most kids um, in third grade are not, uh, fourth grade, I guess, uh, don't have to stay home because they're going through cancer treatments. That would be a non-normative life event. Um, maybe you are 24 and you win the lottery. You win mega millions. You got billions of dollars now. That would be a non-normative life event. Usually the non-normative life events I think of are bad, but the lottery one, that could be good. Okay, another uh, influence that you have to think about is when these, when these experiences occur. So let's say, um, for me, my parents are in late adulthood. Unfortunately, it is pretty normal for me at some point to have one of my parents die. They haven't died yet, but that would be normal. If I was seven years old and one of my parents died, that would not be normal. So the timing of that could influence my development significantly. Um, and also in addition to that, when we think about timing, we can talk about critical periods and sensitive periods. Critical periods are very specific periods of time when you have to experience something or if something happens in that time that has a huge impact on development. A sensitive period is not as intense, right? It's just being more sensitive or less sensitive. So let's say for language, a big one in this class, a critical period for language is that you have to have exposure to language before puberty, or you really have very limited ability to develop it, right? So in the first 11 years, you need to be hearing language, you need to be maybe seeing sign language, you need to have these experiences, or your brain is not going to be able to learn language. That is critical. Sensitive period, let's say though, in your, let's say you are age three to five and you have chronic ear infections. And when every time you have an ear infection, it's hard to hear and you're not hearing all those speech sounds. You're still getting language, but you might be delayed in acquiring some of those speech sounds. You might have some trouble that might roll into literacy problems later. That's being more sensitive, but it's not necessarily critical like with that critical period. A second influence on development um, that researchers are looking at is what things are remaining the same across the lifespan 
and what things are changing, right? Really, this class is overwhelmingly about looking at the changes that happen across the lifespan. But there are some things that are relatively stable. Um, the two that are commonly talked about in psychology are your intelligence and your personality traits. These are pretty stable throughout your lifespan. Um, while everything else seems to be changing, right? The number of words in your vocabulary, your memory span, um, your height, your weight may be even changing. And our third influence on development that we're going to, um, that you, someone might consider doing research in this would be whether they're looking at um, the changes across the lifespan as happening in a continuous manner or in stages. So continuous change might be like this graph on the left, right? This line graph, we're looking at maybe how many words in someone's vocabulary or how many digits they can remember in a memory test. And we can say, as the person gets older, they're remembering more. We can kind of draw the, um, you know, track someone's weight and height. This is continuous change. The majority of the work in this class, the, the theories we're gonna cover are gonna focus on stages. So. Our stage models say maybe from birth to age five, you think a certain way, and now that's a certain stage. We're going to call it this and describe it this way. And then you move into a different stage, and now you're thinking in a different way. And you do that for five years, and now you move into a different stage. Um, with physical development, a stage could be um, you're growing as a child, and now you're in puberty. Puberty would be a stage versus not being in puberty. Uh, but generally, all of our theories, we're going to have so many, if you think, hopefully you remember the name Piaget, that's a stage theory, and we're going to focus on those mostly in this class. Okay, so speaking of theories, there are so many researchers and so many different theories we're going to cover throughout this semester, and I just want to kind of blow through a whole bunch right now. Uh, hopefully you remember from intro psych, most of this stuff. Uh, Freud, right? We Even though he has a theory of psychosocial development, sorry, psychosexual development, um, even though he does have this developmental theory, it was not developed using the scientific method, and thus it's not really a part of this class. Um, so hopefully you got that in intro psych, but if you do remember ideas like the id, ego, superego, the unconscious mind, um, that's all Freud. One of his uh, students who followed him was Eric Erickson, and he took a much more positive view of humans as Freud thought we were kind of animals who were desperate for sex and had lots of aggressive impulses. Erickson thought we could also have a lot of good impulses, and he developed a very important theory on um, socio-emotional development. So in the second half of the semester, we will go through that eight-stage theory. And you can look at um, look at that in your book. It's laid out. Uh, also, another um, psychologist who's important for developmental psych is Skinner. If you remember reinforcement, punishment, that's operant conditioning. That all came from behaviorism um, as uh, researched and described by B.F. Skinner. So that's definitely how a lot of learning takes place, right? Especially language and other things we'll talk about, how reinforcement and punishment can help development. Um, Jean Piaget, a Swiss psychologist who developed probably our, our most well-known theory of cognitive development. Uh, hopefully you heard of this in intro psych. We'll be spending quite a lot of time on it. Um, in the cognitive development section. So sensory motor stage, the pre-operational stage, all of that, um, schemas, assimilation, accommodation. Hopefully that sounds familiar. Um, humanism, uh, Carl Rogers, an important psychologist who was very optimistic about humans and thought we were all trying to improve our lives, um, make ourselves better people. Um, and that's what the goal of our development is, is to make our um, ourselves better humans, right? And then um, our two you may not have heard of that come from the contextual approach, uh, Yuri Bronfenbrenner and Lev Vygotsky. So Bronfenbrenner has a very expansive theory, and you will actually be writing a paper on this. So I thought I'd just pull it up right here. You can take a good look at this. 
Um, essentially, he's saying in his theory that you can't just look at an individual at their cognitive domain or their personality or emotional development. They have to be considered within the whole context of their life. So you've got this huge model where you've got the individual in the middle, their um, gender, their age, their health status, everything about that person, their personality traits, and then they're surrounded by this microsystem that affects them. This includes their family, their school, their peers, the neighborhood they live in, the health services that they have access to, right? These things are influencing them. And that moves through into the exosystem, right? Where this is more extended friends and neighbors, maybe grandma or grandpa, the TV shows they watch, the services they receive, right? Um, and beyond that, the macro system, the attitudes and ideologies of the culture that they live in. Are they within a cultural group that has a lot of discrimination or a lot of negative stereotypes? Um, are those things affecting them? And then all of this is happening over time, right? Within that cohort or generation, right? You're having all those influences and all the conditions that they've been experiencing throughout their lifespan that's happening in the world around them. Okay, this is huge, right? This is including everything. And this is something that you will have to consider um, this semester. Um, Vygotsky, he was really about learning and how can we use um, what he called scaffolding to try to boost people up kids mostly, into learning the next part of the skill they're trying to gain. Okay, so hopefully some of that was familiar to you. We're going to get into all of those different theories throughout the semester. So the last part of this, which I'm also going to go through kind of quickly because I'm hoping it's a review, um, is some research methods, right? You remember the scientific method? You've um, got a question, you read all the literature out there and find out has it even been answered. If it hasn't, you can develop a hypothesis that you can test, right? You figure out what research design you're going to use. You collect the data. Is your hypothesis correct or not? If it is or isn't, you can add that information to a broader theory, right? When we're doing research um, in developmental psychology, you're going to have to decide, is this going to be a field study where you're out in the real world where these things are happening? Or is it going to be more artificial in a lab where there's um, a lot more control over what's happening? A lot of the research we're going to talk about is in a laboratory setting. Um, it's just easier to conduct research that way. Um, and is the research you're looking at more theoretical or more applied? If it's more theoretical, then we're really looking at that describing and explaining questions in psychology um, versus applied research where you're really trying to modify or change someone in their environment to improve their situation. Uh, when we look at the research design, some of these are going to be descriptive and then some are experimental. There are lots of different descriptive um, research designs, right? You can decide, are you doing qualitative research that has um, really descriptions, categorizing narratives and coming up with um, concepts to describe what you're seeing? Or is it more quantitative with numbers and data? I always did quantitative research. I got a bias there. Um, is your uh, research going to be in a natural a setting? So that field research, that would be a naturalistic observation. Um, are you looking at something that's really unique and thus you're going to be doing a case study of a single individual or a small number of people? Um, is it going to be survey research? You're going to develop a survey and distribute it to all the people you're interested in and hearing from? Is it going to be correlational research? Correlational research is when you have two sets of data and you look to see if they change in a similar or different way. Hopefully this sounds familiar, right? Um, an easy example for me is the number of hours you spend studying, the higher your score on a test, right? Fewer hours, lower score. Those would have a positive correlation or maybe even a high positive correlation coefficient, which would be the number describing it, which might be 0.8, let's say. You can also have things go in the opposite way. Like let's say as the temperature outside goes up, the number of items of clothing you wear goes down. That would be a negative correlation. So maybe a negative 0.8 or something like that. And then there's also descriptive research using technology like MRI machines, CAT scans, and 
EEGs or electroencephalograms, which is recording of brain activity. These are just descriptive, right? You're presenting information to someone and you're seeing what happens in the brain. If you want to be able to say that I know what's causing this, you need to use an experiment. And if that's going to be conducted, you're going to develop an, uh, your independent variable and your dependent variable. Right? This should all be review, right? Independent variable is the group that's getting the treatment, right? You're going to say, okay, you're getting um, this drug, and then the control group is getting the fake placebo drug, right? And you're going to be randomly assigning people to the treatment or the control group, and then you're going to measure, right? What is the score? What is the outcome? What is the data? That would be your dependent variable. And then lastly, very specific to developmental psychology are these three types of research designs. Because remember, often we're looking at what is changing over time. So a longitudinal study would be getting a group of people. Let's say um, you wanna study memory ability in young children. So you give a memory test to a bunch of kindergartners and you visit them once a year, every year, to see what their memory scores are. How do they change over time? That would be a longitudinal study. A cross-sectional study would be getting a cross-section of ages at a single time. So maybe you go to the school that week and you test the kindergartners, first graders, second graders, third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders. Now you've got scores from kindergarten through fifth grade and you can say, does memory ability seem to change? It's just a cross-section. Obviously you did it in one day instead of five, six years, so it's a lot faster. And a sequential study is a combination of both. So maybe you go in and test the kindergartners and the first graders, and you come back every year testing them as they get older, but you're also testing multiple ages. So that would kind of be a happy medium, but still take quite a long time. So these are very important specific to developmental psychology. Okay, this is where we are at. Um, that's chapter one, a quick overview, and I hope that helps, um, helps you narrow down your studying um, while you're getting ready for the exam.